Every family wants to have a doctor in it, don't they? And if you can't get a doctor, well, then a physician's assistant will do. And if you can't get a physician's assistant, well, we'll take an RN or anyone for that matter, anyone who counts as a medical professional. Every family likes to have those kind of people in it because we all like free advice, don't we? We all like free advice from an expert, especially when it comes to all the things that ail us. So if you have that person in your family, or if you are that person in your family, you know how it goes, don't you? The phone rings, and it's going to be a question. Hey, I've got this ache in my back. What should I do about it? Hey, look at this rash here. What do you think this is? Hey, I've got this thing. My doctor said I should take that medicine, but what should I really do? Every family wants to have that doctor or PA or nurse in there because we all have so many things that ail us. And it's always nice, it's always nice, isn't it, to have someone speak with authority. Might be something as simple as, well, take some Tylenol and rest. That's usually how it goes, isn't it? Or the way that my sister always put it to us, stop asking me that, go and see your doctor. But we all like to have those authorities, and we all have plenty of ailments. Whether it's a skin rash on just the surface, or some deep ache or deep pain, or some symptom that just won't seem to go away, there is no end to all of the things that ail us. And so there's no end to all of the different doctors, all of the different specialists, all of the different appointments, all of the different medications, all of the different prescriptions, all of the different diagnoses, whatever the plural is, you get the point, don't you? And as it is for us in our families, so it went for Jesus in his ministry. You almost can't turn a page in the Holy Gospels and find a place where someone's not coming to Jesus and saying, hey, can you do something about this? I've got this rash on my skin. What do you think, Lord? I've got this ailment. What do you think, Lord? I know a guy who's got a problem. Can you do something about it, Lord? And time after time after time, Jesus heals. I was going to count them all up, you know, this week, and I started to count up all of the healings in the Gospels, and then I turned to a page in my study Bible, and I found out that somebody already had. (laughs) 36 miracles Jesus performed. Now, not all of them were healings, right? We wouldn't count the walking on water or the multiplication of the bread as a healing, and yet 36 of these miraculous signs our Lord performed. And of those 36, 27 of them were physical healings. And that doesn't even include all of these other times where it says things like, and they brought everyone who had any ailment to Jesus, and he healed them all. How many times did our Lord Jesus reach out his hand? How many times did he speak the word, be cleansed, and they were cleansed? How many times did our Lord see us suffering and have compassion on us? And yet for all of that, how many times did he not? You know, it's easy to lose sight of that. We just assume that everyone who was around Jesus, everyone who was brought to him was instantly healed. But surely that wasn't the case. If Jesus was always performing healings, there never would have been time for anything else. If Jesus was constantly healing everyone who had any illness, who had any disease, who had any sickness, who had any ailment, who had any rash on their skin, he never would have gone to sleep. There's this story in the Gospel of John that I think captures it for us. Jesus went to a place called Bethesda. And there was this healing pool in Bethesda. And the thought was that when that water got stirred up, there was an angel that stirred it up. And so if you could get yourself into the water while the water was still stirred up, while it was still bubbling, then you could be healed. And it must have happened a time or two at least, otherwise nobody would do that, right? But Jesus was there one day and he only healed one man. Now that place was chock full of people with ailments. That place was chock full of people who were lame, who were paralyzed, who were sick, who were looking for some kind of healing. It was full of people who had asked their relatives, hey, what should I do about this? And they all said, go to Bethesda. And yet Jesus only healed one man that day. It's not simply that everyone Jesus saw, he instantly healed. 
And that doesn't show us that, you know, Jesus didn't care about those things. I only mention it to you this morning so that you could see, so that you could see from our Lord's eyes what it must look like to look out on a world that is sick, to look out on a world that is full of suffering, that is full of illness, that is full of ailment, that is full of sin. What must it have been like for Jesus to look out and to know that he wasn't going to take care of every little symptom right then and there? Don't you think, don't you think that maybe it troubled Jesus that he wasn't just healing everyone right away? Jesus, the man of sorrows who was acquainted with griefs, I'm sure it was no small thing to our Lord to have to turn people away, to have to say, you know what, I need to rest now. Maybe I'll come back next week. Maybe I'll come back next month, and then we can deal with the illnesses and sicknesses. As much as those miracles of Jesus manifest his marvelous power, and they certainly do that, they were only signs pointing ahead to something else. Jesus had not come simply to deal with the rash on the skin. Jesus had not come simply to heal the headache that was pounding in the brain of those who were around him. Jesus had not come simply to say, all right, let's heal up that knee, let's fix up that back, let's make, take care of that ankle that's troubling you. Those were all symptoms, and our Lord was sensitive to the symptoms. Our Lord healed those symptoms, but our Lord, like a good physician, like the great physician, knew that if he was going to deal with the real cause, it wasn't enough to just say, here, have some Tylenol. Here, take some aspirin. Here, let's relieve it temporarily. Let's fix this problem today, and then when you have another problem, come on back, and then when you have another problem, come on back, and then when you... You see the point. If Jesus was really going to deal with the things that ail us, he has to get to the cause. And so he wasn't interested in just performing a sign here, a marvel there, a wonder here, a powerful thing on occasion. Jesus doesn't always heal our symptoms, does he? From our perspective, Jesus' miracles should happen, right? We wish that they would always happen, and it troubles us even to this day that they don't constantly happen. Why is it, Lord, that I am sick and you're not doing anything about it? Why is it, Lord, that my sister is sick, that my daughter is sick, that my grandfather is sick and nothing is happening about it? Don't you think that it troubled the disciples, too, that Jesus wasn't just constantly healing everybody? I mean, put yourself in Andrew's shoes, for instance, this morning. Andrew saw plenty of these miracles of Jesus, and I'm sure he thought the same thing that you and I would think. Man, Jesus, this is great. Let's just set up shop, and we can just bring everybody to you, and you can just heal people all day long. You can just keep on healing them, right? You have the power to do it, Jesus, so let's set it up. But our Lord didn't do that, did he? For as many of those miracles as he performed, there was another that he didn't. For as many of those lepers who he cleansed, there was another who he didn't. For as many of those healings as he gave, there was at least 10 that our Lord Jesus did not give, at least not in that moment. Now, why wouldn't Jesus heal? We ask questions like that all the time, don't we? And it could be, right, it could be perhaps that he doesn't heal us to teach us something, right? Why doesn't Jesus take away the hangover headache? Well, it's so that you learn not to drink so much, right? Obviously. It could be that our sicknesses, that our illnesses are the discipline of the Lord. Or it might not always be, you know, an exact cause and effect like that, but it could be that our Lord uses our weaknesses, that he uses our illnesses to strengthen us in faith. And so you know how it often goes. When is it that we pray most? When is it that we search the scriptures and hold fast to the promises of our Lord Jesus? It's not when everything is going well, it's when we are sick. When someone who we know, when someone who we love is near to the point of death, then the gospel promises of Jesus are pressed home on us. But sometimes it's not necessarily even that. Sometimes it seems like there is no answer, that even in hindsight we can't look back and say, aha, that's what the Lord was teaching me. That's how he was strengthening me. There are times in each of your lives, I know, because you've told me about some of them, there are times in each of your lives and in my life where it seems that there is no answer to the question of Jesus, why don't you do something about it? 
But that's because we don't see from his perspective. We see from our perspective. We see our sicknesses. We know our griefs. We know our pains. But we do not see from the eyes of the great physician. We do not see from the eyes of Jesus that there is a yes, I will, be cleansed, be healed, that covers all of the things that hurt us. That's what the miracles of Jesus point ahead to. Right? Jesus didn't come just to deal with the symptoms. Right? Note that very well so that when the symptoms come up in your life, you aren't surprised and shocked and think, man, Jesus forgot about me. He did all that good stuff for everybody else, but he's overlooked me now. Jesus did not come to fix every symptom of the sickness of our world. He came to cure the actual thing the actual root cause. And so you notice in these healings that we heard about this morning, there is always this pointing ahead in the signs of Jesus. That's what John's gospel calls the miracles. He calls them signs that point ahead. So Jesus cleansed that leper. Take this one first. He cleansed the leper, and then he said, now don't tell anyone about this. (laughs) Well, come on, Jesus, really? You cleanse someone of leprosy, and then you tell them not to talk about it. And you know what happens when you search through the Gospels? Jesus said that to a lot of people. He healed all kinds of people, and then he told them, now, keep it under wraps. Don't tell anyone. Instead, Jesus says, go and show yourself to the priest as a witness, as a testimony, as evidence to them. See, simply getting people to notice that there's someone who can do a bunch of healings was not the point. Jesus cleansed that man of leprosy to have mercy on him, to be sure, but Jesus had a bigger perspective in mind. He cleansed that leper so that all Israel would know, like they knew back in the days of Elisha, that there is a prophet in Israel, that the Lord God has visited his people. You heard how the king of Israel at the time when Naaman came, he thought, look, no one can cleanse leprosy. This king of Syria, this is all just a ploy. This is all just a trick. He sent me Naaman, and he told me to heal him just so he could go to war with me. But Elisha knew that there is a God who heals leprosy. There is a Lord who cleanses, and he is not far from his people, but he is near. And so Elisha said, look, king, give him to me. Let me show you what the Lord can do. And so it was in the days of Jesus that he came not just to do a random healing here or a random healing there, but he came to show the whole world his epiphany, the revelation that God is with us to heal us, that God is not against us, that God is not opposed to us, that he does not care about us, he is not far from us, but he is near to heal us. See that you tell no one, but go and show yourself as evidence, as a proof, so that all would know that the Lord God has come near. And Jesus does much the same when he heals the centurion, right? Jesus never marvels. It's kind of amazing. Jesus never marvels at the things he does. Now think about how incredible that is. Here's a guy who can walk on water, who can multiply the bread, and he acts like it's all no big deal. How many of you? How many of you, when you do anything remotely noticeable, post it on Facebook, right? You want the whole world to see, hey, look at what I can do. But Jesus never marvels at his power. Jesus never marvels at his miracles. Jesus never marvels at his healings. Instead, he marvels, note this well, he marvels at the faith of the centurion. See, Jesus wasn't interested in just the symptom. That's my point this morning. If you don't remember anything else, remember this. Jesus does not marvel at dealing with a headache, with a little ache or a pain. It is Jesus' mission. His whole life is meant to heal the root cause of all of our diseases. And so when he encounters this centurion who is full of faith, Jesus says, this guy This guy is the healthy one. This guy is the strong one, not because he has it all together, not because he has no ailments, not because I've even done anything for him, right? The centurion confesses his faith even before Jesus heals anyone. But the centurion is marveled at by Jesus because he is healthy in faith. He is strong in faith. And he makes this great confession about Jesus. Hey, Jesus, look, I know how it goes for guys like us. We have authority, right? Whatever I say to my soldiers, they immediately do. And so, Jesus, whatever you say, 
whether it's to a fever, whether it's to a demon, whether it's to a man or a woman or a child, whether it's to anyone, whatever you say, Jesus, you have the authority to bring about. Jesus marvels at faith like that because it is faith like that that he has come to establish. Here is the true healing for what ails us. Here is the true cure for the things that would destroy us. Here is the light that Jesus brings to drive away the gloom and the darkness. Here is the health that Jesus provides for each and every one of you, even those of you who have all the symptoms that aren't removed. It is the healing of faith. St. Matthew goes on in his gospel to talk more about Jesus' healings. In just a few verses after our gospel reading, he quotes the prophet Isaiah, and he says this, All this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. He took our illnesses, and he bore our diseases. And later, St. Matthew, just so that we get the point, quotes Isaiah again about the healing of Jesus and says, This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. Behold, my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved one, with whom my soul is pleased. He will not, a bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench until he brings justice to victory. The work of Jesus was not simply to do a wonder here or a marvel there. The work of Jesus, the healing of Jesus, had to get to the root cause. And so he had to take our illnesses. He had to bear our griefs. He had to take into himself our sins. Because at the root cause of all of our diseases, at the root cause of all of our ailments, at the root cause of everything that brings us gloom and darkness is this, sin. And so Jesus, when he passed over a healing here or a healing there, did not do it because he didn't care. And in your own life, when Jesus does not grant healing, even as you fervently pray, Lord, if you will, you can cleanse me. Lord, if you will, you can do something about this. Jesus does not pass over those things because he does not love you. He passes over those things so that you would see how he has healed you permanently. For in his death and by his resurrection, our Lord Jesus has brought justice to victory. In his death and by his resurrection, our Lord Jesus has dealt with every last, every last thing that would bring us pain and cause us grief. Surely he has borne our sorrows and carried our sicknesses and surely he does not bear them in vain. Our Lord Jesus is not some kind of impotent physician. He is not some kind of powerless doctor. He never has to consult the books and say, well, this one's beyond me. No, our Lord Jesus knows how to heal. He knows how to save, and he has done it. So take heart, dear friends. There is a prophet in Israel who still stands. Take heart, dear friends. There is a Lord who who brings to death and who can raise to life. And he is on your side. He is on your side to heal you even now as he did long ago. Does he deal with every last one of the symptoms? Perhaps not. But what he has given you is the healing for all of your ills. In the waters of his holy baptism, he has washed you and joined you to himself. In the sacrament of his body and blood, he says to you again this day, I am yours and you are mine. So that you can say like the centurion said, Lord, whatever you say is good. And when you can say that, when you can say that in the face of sickness, in the face of ailment, in the face of grief, and in the face of death, then know this and know it well that Jesus marvels at you, that he says to you, you will feast with me, you will recline at rest with me, you will be free of all of the things that now grieve you, there will not be a headache, there will not be a broken nail, there will not be a sore knee in the kingdom of heaven, there will be perfect peace, there will be perfect rest, there will be perfect joy and perfect healing in that day when I raise you up and dine with you forever. To him be the glory now and always. Amen.